the flagship lecture session three on global engagement and equity as part of the Enlight kickoff week. It goes without saying that the last decades are clearly marked by process of globalization and increased factual and also virtual mobility. We move, we move towards a post-national world, an era of global citizenship, the global citizen. However, some would not agree with our so-called post-national world, where formal policies sometimes of dissuading from and discouraging to be mobile are in place. Some experience one gate after the other in this globalized world. While for some, this process of globalization brings prosperity, for others, more, equi more inequity and equality might be experienced. It is disengagement of us all as global citizens of how to strive for equity for all citizens. It is disengagement which is central in this lecture session. Before I introduce the three speakers, I would like to invite you to ask your questions in the chat during the lecture. They will be addressed, if time allows, in the Q&A discussion slot at the end of the session. Now, it is an honor for me to introduce three distinguished speakers who are authorities in their field of expertise. The first lecture will be given by Mrs. Monica Fröhle. Mrs. Fröhle is the CEO of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens, of which Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the eighth Secretary General of the UN, and Mr. Heinz Fischer, the 11th Federal President of Australia, are the co-chairs. Mrs. Fröhle was in, in trend, in trend, trusted sorry, to create the Ban Ki-moon Center after, after working at the UN in Geneva, New York and Vienna, the EU, the, the Austrian Foreign Ministry and in field missions around the globe. She is passionate about the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. Throughout her career, she managed to support hundreds of women, young people and communities all over the globe, especially working in Africa and Latin America to ban landmines, working to improve hospital care in rural Central Asia and Africa, assisting in eco-friendly city planning in Asia and bettering the living conditions of women in the Middle East and West Africa. Mrs. Fröhle's keynote entitled Engaging Global Citizens to achieve the SDGs will center on the theme of engaging global citizens for the achievement of the SDGs. In her lecture, she will focus on the key tenets of global citizenship and how the Ban Ki-moon Center works to engage and empower youth and women as actors for, for the SDGs. She will further discuss the necessary skills and knowledge needed both from formal and informal education to transform today's world and to ensure an equitable and sustainable future for all. The second lecture will be delivered by Professor Andre Findor. Professor Findor is an associate professor and acting director of the Institute of European Studies and International Relations at the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences at the Comenius University in Bratislava. He studied politics at the Communities University and at the Central European University in Budapest in Hungary. His research interests include moral judgment and its relation to the political attitudes interventions aimed at reducing stereotypes, prejudice, and discriminatory behavior against stigmatized uh, groups. In his keynote, with the title, Evidence-Based Approach to Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity at nine European universities, Professor Findel will focus on the comparative evaluation of equity, inclusion, and diversity. To look at indicators at these nine European universities, he will argue that the construction of evidence could become a key factor in developing an operationalizable notion of shared social reality across enlightened universities. Despite their different social ecologies, institutional support and person and category-centered sensitivities, the survey assessing the state of uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity could become a baseline for comparison and potential impact of evaluation of future EID initiatives. And then our third keynote speaker, Dr. Nata Duvuri, 
is senior lecturer and director of the Center for Global Women's Studies and also co-leader of the Gender and Public Policy Cluster in the Whitaker Institute at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Dr. Duvuri is an, international, um, is an international development expert with more than 25 years of experience in gender, development and empowerment. Her work includes research and advocacy on gender-based violence, women's property rights, and HIV and AIDS in a variety of settings, including conflict and post-conflict contexts. She is a recognized global expert and leading advocate on gender equality and has worked closely with both multilateral organizations, such as UN Women, UNFP, uh, UNFPA, WHO, and the World Bank, as well as direct with multiple governments in the global south. In her keynote, which is entitled Approaches to Equality, Mainstreaming or Intersectionality? Question mark, Dr. Duvuri will focus on the need for global and institutional engagement on equity that is grounded in an intersectional approach. While the march to equality, irrespective of the grounds of discrimination, has made steady progress, deeper structures of power and privilege have yet to be fully transformed. The silo mainstreaming approach taken by most institutions to addressing inequality has limited and will continue limit the full transformation of inequitable structures. An intersectional approach requires a constant critical reflection on whose needs and which needs are being made visible and met, thus making it possible to assess the depth and transformation taking place in institutions. Based on experience at the National University of Ireland, Dr. Nata Duvuri will discuss some measures needed for the implementing and, and for implementing an intersectionality approach to realizing equity. And now I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Froehler for the first keynote address. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, it's a privilege to talk to you all today about more than a mission that we are following as the Ban Ki-moon Center, thanks to the leadership of SGBA. Ben will assist me from the Enlight team to share my presentation with all of you. To start us off, we will see a video that has been recorded by Ban Ki-moon already some years ago. He still refers to himself as SG, as Secretary General. Let's see the video. Ben, thank you very much. My name is Ban Ki-moon. I am Secretary General of the United Nations. I was born in Korea. I was six years old when the Korean War started. We had to run from our homes to the mountainside. We could see my village burning. The United Nations saved my family and my country. In my time as a Secretary General, I have been moved by the horrors of humanity and I have been inspired by his heroes. I have wept at the memorials for victims in Auschwitz, Srebrenica and Rwanda. I have dealt with tragedies that have gone on for decades and disasters that destroyed the whole societies overnight. I have also mourned too many courageous United Nations staff members who died serving the cause of peace. 
I believe in having a young mindset. This means standing up to injustice. I hope I will never be too old to ask leaders tough questions. I hope I will always have the energy to speak out for what is right. I think that keeps us young. So ladies and gentlemen, you may see the evidence of someone who truly is a global citizen. And Ki-moon definitely is the personification of that. Why did I choose that video? Because it illustrates the capacity that the Ban Ki-moon Center, which is part of his legacy work, actually wants to enshrine in the young generation. Leadership for the globe. We are, the Ban Ki-moon Center, I'm leading it, I'm the CEO, a quasi-international organization. We are led by two key figures, Ban Ki-moon and Heinz Fischer, the federal president of Austria, formerly. And our mission very much is to empower women and youth for the sustainable development goals. And that, of course, means to help them to obtain global competence like SDG knowledge, like 21st century skills and global citizen values. We are guided in this by the two major legacy achievements of Ban Ki-moon, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. He would never phrase it that way because obviously it's the world community that achieved these two, but he stands patron to these two big agreements. Next slide, please. So, the SDGs obviously are all interlinked. You are an audience that I do not need to introduce the SDGs to, but maybe one phrase that I want to give you that describes them very well is, they are the first time that the world has come together for a world governmental program. We never had anything like this before, and it's outstanding that we could agree amongst all humankind that this will be our plan A to save the planet. Next slide, please. So how does global citizenship come into that? Well, global citizens are very conscious, not only of the SDGs, but want to act upon them. And a friend of mine, Hugh Evans, who you see on that slide, he's the leader of the NGO called Global Citizen. He once said, and very well said, a global citizen is someone who self-identifies first and foremost, not as a member of a state, a tribe or a nation, but instead as a member of the human race. And this leads me back to the video of Ban Ki-moon because of course he had the privileged position of seeing the world like a Neil Armstrong, a Nelson Mandela, like Malala who we have seen in the video. But not every student that we are interacting with has this kind of exposure, but yet there are measures, I'd say, I suggest competencies that can be taught to students even if they can't travel the world. Next slide. So global competencies. Probably many of you have already read or have seen the OECD study on global competencies. It's an assessment that was done in part and parcel of PISA. We know that global competencies are required now more than ever. We see it used more often as a term, global citizenship, global competence, often interchangeably. And we also know that education is taking more and more efforts, undertaking more and more efforts to include global citizenship education and education for sustainable development. Even in the private sector, we see that uh, business wants people that have a notion of social entrepreneurship, who have cultural understanding, who are active in the fields of the planet, people and prosperity, and who know about sustainability. So if you look at the colorful wheel at the side, global competence is very much the possibility of examining local, global, and intercultural issues, but also understanding and appreciating perspectives and other worldviews, engaging in open and effective interactions across cultures, take action for collective well being. And many of the skills, knowledge, values, and actually attitudes that are needed for it already exist. One of the points, and have to be picked up and scaled, one of the points that I want to make is that youth movements right now prominently display that young people are seeing the world as a whole. We, we have phenomena like Fridays for Future, Black Lives Matter, Me Too. Our young generation, particularly generation why millennials and generations said they seek workplaces where they are expecting to find purpose and engagement with social causes locally, regionally and globally. Next slide. 
So indeed, uh, we all know the because, we know why global competences are needed. We need it to solve the big challenges of our globe. We need to implement them, to implement the SDGs. We need them in industry, we need them in commerce, in government, et cetera, et cetera. And what we also need there is the first-hand experience. So not only the cognitive level of global competence, the understanding, but also the first-hand action. So ideally, after having gone through a process of learning about them, four target dimensions would be logically obtained by the student. One would be the capacity to examine issues and situations that have significance throughout humankind, poverty, economic uh, interdependence, migration, etc. The capacity to understand and appreciate other worldviews, the ability to establish positive interactions, independent of religious, or social or ethical or, or cultural backgrounds, and the capacity to take constructive action. And that's the crux of the matter. Next slide. For doing that, you need skills. And literature likes to define the 21st century skills in three layers, into the learning skills, the literacy skills, and the life skills. I'm sure that many of you have already done studies on that, but just to brush through quickly because of time constraints. In the learning skills, we are talking about four Cs, the critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication. In the literacy skills, we are talking about understanding of information, media, and technology. So the math aspect also comes into the literacy skills, actually. And in the case of the life skills, we're talking about flexibility, leadership skills, initiative, productivity, and social skills. Next slide, please. So the Ban Ki-moon Center is building on exactly that. We are trying to utilize our leaders, our leadership, to educate and to advocate and to spread peace and security tough calls and of course, high level calls. And we are trying to do that with very concrete measures and programs. We host fellowship programs, scholarship programs, mentorship programs to give women and youth the opportunity to tap into the world as a global citizen and pick up from the things that they already are aware of and that they have basically detected as challenges. To foster that, we are engaging in education opportunities, including um, GCED and ESD, so Global Citizenship Education and Education for Sustainable Development efforts by UNESCO. We have curated and compiled online classes. And of course, we are engaging our young fellow scholars and mentees to implement SDG microprojects, so hands-on action all across the globe to implement their solutions to the challenges they have seen. We advocate in major campaigns together with partners because we couldn't do that alone for adaptation, for empowerment of women and youth, for gender equality, stopping violence against women and also sustainable cities that are definitely a nucleus of the developments that we see um, more and more in the, coming, in the coming years and decades. And in the case of peace and security, Ban Ki-moon is often called into into scenarios where he's asked to mediate. And, and in this case, we are trying to get more young people around the table and to the decision-making places, as much as women who are still underrepresented in peace and security efforts worldwide. Next slide. So our impact so far, and we are a young organization, we only exist ever since Ban Ki-moon stopped his tenure as SG. As a young organization, we have in the meantime reached about 700,000 young people with our SDG microprojects. We are active in 40 countries. Of course, numerous speaking engagements, many mentees and, and scholars and fellows are already part of our alumni network. And we are happy that our online courses have seen a pickup of 20,000 subscribers, and we are hoping to scale that even more in the future. Next slide. So let me tell you a bit about two of our great kind of policy engagements. One of them is called Mission 4.7. And what you see on the cover here is His Holiness the Pope and Ban Ki-moon shaking his hand. We have forged an alliance of UNESCO, SDSN, which is the Sustainable Development Solution Network, Global Schools, the Holy See, Columbia University, and many other universities across the globe. What do we want to do? We believe it is time to transform learning and teaching and that we need ESD, GCED, so global competence teaching enshrined in all of the informal and formal learning uh, efforts worldwide. 
that pertains to SDG knowledge, to 21st century skills, but also to global citizen values. We have launched it last December and will now this year really take a major effort in, in case of the UNESCO conferences, but also of COP26, to come up with a steer for environmental and educational ministers to fuse forces on introducing more and more young people to exactly these concepts. Next slide. Our fellowship programs, I briefly touched upon them. We cater to young people that are engaged in the SDGs and who want to scale. We had training cohorts from Asia, from the GCC, soon have one from Latin America with us in Vienna and the Diplomatic Academy is helping us with this one. And then the, the, our young fellows are trained and are going back home equipped with the knowledge and equipped with some new skills to implement SDG micro projects. Next slide. Similarly, that's the case with our mentorship programs, and we are very eager to engage with the Enlight Network on yet another round of mentorship, uh, a cohort of mentorship on global health, because we truly believe with COVID-19, there is lots of room to elevate the voices of the young and to give them the skills and the competencies to actually go out into the world and change things to the better. Next slide. Scholarships, similarly, we have a scholarship program that particularly is right now aimed at scholars from Africa. Uh, University of Bordeaux was a phenomenal platform to host our African scholars last year, and we are hoping for another round of that for in the year 2021. They obtain training, they can participate in major conferences, uh, witness or sometimes contribute to expert workshops, and again, they're implementing SDG micro projects. Next slide. So these phenomenal micro projects are actually the nuts and bolts of what the Ban Ki-moon Center stands for. Why? Because Ban Ki-moon believes that only by doing, by practicing your competencies, by practicing your skills, you will really become a global citizen caring for humankind. And this is the reason that our micro projects in the meantime have taken ground, next slide, all across the globe. And you will see on the map um, that we have about, well, here you see six scholars that are highlighted, but we have about 100 projects uh, to reach 700,000 people. And just to illustrate maybe two, you see the lady that is doing like that, that's Kath from Cambodia. She is a blogger and managed to reach with her blog on taboo topics in Cambodia about women empowerment, about women health, about sex positivity, and about LGBTQIA, she reached in the meantime 2.5 million people by doing what she is passionate about. Or maybe you have a look at uh, Farida, she's the, she's the lady from Afghanistan, who is um, very active in peace talks. She has started roundtables in Afghanistan to include women into peace building exercises. And by opening up these platforms, she has actually made it more possible for women to intersect into certain echelons that were sort of completely closed. Yes, Farida is sometimes risking her life doing these things, um, but in the meantime has started a stellar career. And I could go on about all our scholars uh, in, in Ghana, Alassan for recycling up, et cetera, et cetera. They do amazing things of, uh, and find solutions of problems that we might not even be cognizant about, but they of course know the local context. And to have something of that sort also working for Europe with the help of the Enlight Network would be absolutely amazing. Next slide. Youth in Peace Building, leading on from Farida, our lady in Afghanistan, to include youth and women into peace building efforts is, is absolutely crucial because we will not build the future as we want it to be if we are not including the society that is struck hardest by conflict. So we are working with the African Union, we are working with the UN Youth Envoy, with the OSCE, with CTBTO, supporting the UN Security Council resolutions that are pertaining particularly to youth, peace and security. All of them say youth needs to be around the decision-making tables. Little is done. And you see on the left side, the We Are Here publication that I can only strongly recommend to many of you who are interested in this field. There are tangible action-oriented recommendations of how youngsters can be better included into peace building effort, what needs to be done. So this publication has been developed by young activists um, together with 
some of the partners that we named here. Next slide. Our online classes, I already mentioned them, they have 20,000 subscribers. They pertain to SDGs, global citizenship and gender equality. So for everyone who wants an easy segue into these subjects, they are readily available for free. Uh, that's the website, you see the Ban Ki-moon Center website offers them. And here too, we hope that enlightened students will take the advantage of having resources like these available to get a glimpse into a world that is a bit broader even than Europe. Next slide. So I will close with the Enlight Network as we are very excited to have started this amazing collaboration with an audience of more than 312,000 European students. And I've said before, imagine just a third of them, just a third every year gets insights into exactly the themes that I have alluded to, gets an insight or a taste for global competencies. Imagine what kind of game-changing force it would be to have this amazing clout of people acting for the SDGs and working on the fulfillment of the Paris Climate Agreement. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are hoping that the fundamental transformation of European higher education by empowering learners as globally engaged citizens with state-of-the-art knowledge, skills, and innovation potential will become a reality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Fröhle, for a very inspiring uh, talk. And um, with no further ado, I would like to give the floor now to Professor Findor. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, I would like to talk about evidence-based approach to equity, inclusion, and diversity at nine European universities. But before I do that, um, I would like to make um, two notes. First, uh, uh, you might have already noticed my weird uh, camera angle. I apologize for this inconvenience. Um, um, it's a small glitch in the design of the computer I have, and there is really not much I can do. I tried to put it in front of me, but my colleagues told me that this is actually the, the better option. So I hope uh, you can bear that for the uh, next 20 minutes. And this is especially kind of like um, 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 this, uh, this note or remark is especially appropriate to make because I have no PowerPoint slides. So uh, I actually I'm forcing you to look at me. So again, my apologies. Uh, second point, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the subject matter, which is, uh, uh, which is being developed uh, in um, uh, equity core group of uh, online network. And uh, what I will be presenting are uh, my, my ideas, my opinions, but uh, they are all subject to further discussion in our core group. So this is not something uh, like uh, me telling you how, 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 how um, our core group will do things, but this is some kind of a beginning of a discussion. I will talk about uh, three types of challenges. I'm going to talk about equity, inclusion, and diversity. I'm going to talk about shared reality, and I'm going to talk about construction of evidence. Uh, when we talk about uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity, it's important to make um, uh, one terminological clarification. Uh, the notion of equity has uh, opposing meanings in uh, justice and fairness literature in uh, various social science fields, such as uh, ethics, uh, philosophy, uh, political science, sociology, or social psychology. Um, equity can mean at, at the same time both equality of opportunity and proportionality. So I'm going to use equity uh, as a synonym um, for equality of opportunity or uh, equality in a more general sense. Because when we perceive equity uh, as equality, we are basically talking about three different types of equality. We are talking about equality in opportunity, equality in outcome and equality in procedure. Uh, so my understanding of equity or if you want equality or equal opportunity entails all these three dimensions, opportunity, outcome, outcome and procedure. Uh, when I will talk about inclusion and exclusion, uh, it's, important, uh, um, it's important to add that uh, um, students from all these nine universities, but also from other universities in, um, in Europe, um, uh, they might experience uh, um, different degrees or even different types of precariousness or marginalization. Uh, 
up. So uh, I'm I'm building um, my short talk on the premise that uh, unfortunately not all students uh, uh, are being treated equally or on equal terms or with equal procedures, or that university our uh, um, that the education our university is offering might not lead all the time to equal outcomes. So uh, uh, so it is always. Uh, it is always important to have in mind that there, there can always be present some, um, 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 some uh, degree of precariousness or marginalization uh, among our students' bodies. Uh, when talking about inclusion and exclusion, uh, uh, one of the, one of the um, um, uh, useful concepts which might be use, uh, used for, um, for dealing with this and actually working with this in comparative terms is the concept of capital developed by the uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. And, uh, 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 and what I have in mind is uh, economic capital, social capital, and cultural capital. Uh, they all refer to three uh, uh, um, um, distinct types of uh, resources uh, uh, which are uh, at disposal of people in, uh, again, in different degrees. I mean, economic is pretty straightforward. Social is the one, you know, how well someone connected this and uh, from what uh, type of, uh, um, uh, uh, for example, family with certain connection one comes or uh, cultural capital uh, can actually mean uh, what that person is and who, who that person is, what uh, he or she represents by that knowledge, uh, uh, how, what kind of value is attributed to that. So again, when we talk about inclusion and exclusion, it's, uh, 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 it's, uh, it's also good to have in mind that our students have, uh, uh, or this, um, uh, have different disponibilities. They, they dispose of different types of, uh, uh, of, of capital, of resources. Uh, uh, one important uh, um, remark, uh, which uh, kind of like uh, uh, connects my lecture to to the to the to the to the present time to the real time in which it is happening is that um, we are all experiencing uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, this pandemic uh, has uh, unfortunately deepened uh, uh, the social exclusion for many people or for many categories of people. For example, uh, maybe that is not the case of my colleagues at other universities, but in my classes I can sometimes um, uh, experience that, for example, internet access is not something which would be freely available to all students at all, at all times and uh, let's say at all speeds. And also uh, what I can experience is that some of the students, they are uh, going through a very difficult socioeconomic situation. For example, some of their parents uh, became unemployed because, uh, um, um, because uh, uh, they are experiencing economic downturn or students themselves, uh, 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 they are losing their part-time jobs because of the economy and uh, that also contributes to worsening of their socioeconomic situation. So this inclusion and exclusion, it's also something which is much more visible at the present time. Uh, when we are talking uh, about diversity, and of course, we can imagine diversity in, uh, uh, um, in, uh, um, in all areas of, of, of its meaning, but uh, I think it's crucial uh, to mention one implicit contradiction, which uh, I think is uh, uh, represented in the system of higher education. We have not only at my university, but I also uh, think in at other universities, in the, not only in the, in the, in the NLIGHT network, and that is uh, the contradiction or this kind of contention between uh, diversity as a normative ideal and ideal of excellence and early status uh, that actually eliminates diversity. So diversity as normative ideal in the sense that uh, 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 at many universities, including the enlightened ones, uh, we value diversity or, uh, or, or at least I mean, there are also, I mean, some uh, differences between the universities, but the, the diversity is something which is, which is valued by, by uh, uh, not only by universities, but by, the, by their staff, by their students, even by the, uh, the governments or the institutions which are setting up the universities. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the same, the very same universities, uh, they are uh, being made to be excellent. They are being made to uh, contribute uh, and to develop their early status as uh, as, a, as, a, as an elite institutions of higher learning, and uh, 
this alone can actually lead to the elimination of diversity because this push for uh, excellence, this push for elite status can actually lead uh, to the selection uh, of, uh, of uh, only certain types of students, which are actually, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, more prone to uh, help to achieve this elite status and excellence. Uh, another important topic um, is a shared reality. And of course, this shared reality, it's a, it's a challenge because there are differences, and, but there are also similarities between nine European universities. At present times, we don't really know how much uh, uh, or what kind of social reality is shared across uh, our students' bodies at these nine enlightened universities. So if you want to have a kind of like an evidence-based approach to this, uh, uh, we are basically uh, uh, doing a social or sociographic exploration because we want to find out how the, how, how the reality is. Uh, uh, Important factor in uh, this concept or in this notion of shared reality, and, and of course its construction, are social equality, are social ecologies. By social ecologies, I understand uh, the simple fact that our universities are embedded in a diverse social environments. For example, they are existing uh, in different uh, types of municip municipalities, different types of cities or towns. Some of them are smaller towns, some of them are big cities. Uh, they also exist in the social environment, uh, which might have different demographic compositions. And by this demographic composition, I also mean the socioeconomic status uh, of the inhabitants. So these social uh, ecologies alone, they are intimately related to how students can experience uh, 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 the equal opportunity, diversity, or inclusion or exclusion. Uh, Another important uh, facet of uh, uh, constructed social reality uh, uh, are, let's say, differing person and category-based uh, 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 sensitivities. So for example, I think uh, uh, when we look at the, at the network of these nine universities in, um, in, in uh, Enlight universities, uh, we might realize that, for example, uh, uh, the sensitivity toward being a single parent or a single mother as a student or a student with immigrant background uh, has, uh, would have uh, probably, and that's what I'm expecting, uh, uh, a certain variance. So uh, it will not be very similar and actually it would be probably experienced by different, uh, by, uh, let's say, uh, different students, different uh, categories of students in a different way at these universities. And of course, this is intimately tied to our differing notions and norms of equality, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, so uh, one of the uh, an example I can mention, for example, in Slovakia, uh, right now, we have an ongoing census. So, but in the census 10 years ago, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a category for, uh, for a Slovak citizen to register in the census, uh, uh, someone who considered himself or herself as, uh, as Muslim. So Islam was only mentioned, uh, uh, if, if someone was a Muslim, they could only choose the category of other religions. Of course, uh, uh, this has been remedied and uh, in the present census, they can uh, choose, uh, uh, they, can, they can choose to, you know, like to take the category of, uh, of Islam as their religion. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, largely in uh, Slovak society for many years, the, the, the Muslims and Islams, they, made, made, they were made invi uh, invisible. This can be a stark contrast to, uh, to, uh, um, so, uh, um, to experience of students at these other European universities in which to be a Muslim is actually something which is being accounted for. Uh, Third important asset or aspect of uh, shared reality and shared reality as a challenge is uh, institutional support. There are actually different institutional routines to, to deal with challenges of equity, inclusion di and diversity at these nine enlightened uh, 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 universities. For example, in some of them, we can see that there is a long tradition and actually supported by government to monitor and deal with experiences of equal opportunity and, and diversity. At other universities, 
like mine, Communist University in Bratislava, there is actually no such tradition, tradition and this tradition needs to be founded. So, uh, so again, when we are talking about uh, shared reality, we have to take also in the account that we are not uh, uh, at these nine enlightened univers universities, we are not starting um, uh, from the same starting point. But actually, we have uh, we, uh, uh, we have we have uh, we have um, underwent uh, uh, different types of paths towards uh, uh, monitoring and uh, dealing with uh, uh, equality, uh, diversity, and inclusion. Last but not least, and I think this is the this is the last kind of like a third of uh, of my today's talk, is the construction of evidence. Uh, something which would uh, help us to capture this uh, challenging shared reality. And of course, first uh, important notion which uh, deserves uh, a little bit of discussion is evidence-based approach to equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, um, evidence has become uh, one of the most important um, facets of, uh, of uh, today's so, uh, policy design. Uh, uh, the in, uh, evidence uh, is important uh, um, for uh, designing uh, policies and for uh, making decisions for many decision makers, not only in the governmental bodies, but also in, uh, let's say, private companies uh, uh, and, and also for uh, many international organizations. So evidence as such, uh, it, has, it has become something uh, which is at the same time being perceived as some kind of a golden standard to how to do things in policy area. But on the other hand, it has also become something which is uh, being contested. I mean, what do we count as a, what do we count as a quality evidence? You know, how the evidence is constructed? Who should be uh, uh, participating or who should be collaborating when this evidence is constructed? Uh, uh, also, this construction of evidence should entail the, uh, mm, the, this kind of like a fundamental comparison of how each partner university deals with the challenges of diversity, inclusion, and equal opportunities. It should allow us to understand how these are experienced by uh, students from different target groups and all these educational institutions. Uh, when constructing the evidence, I'm going to talk about uh, two um, uh, research methods which might help us, uh, uh, um, which might help us to actually conduct this construction of evidence. The first one is focus groups, focus groups or focus group discussions. And the second one is collective survey. I will start focus group with focus groups. Focus groups, uh, they allow us or they could allow us uh, to make this comparison of these all partner universities and students' experiences of, uh, of equity, inclusion, and diversity. They could, uh, they could allow us to make this uh, endeavor student-centered. What I mean by that is that we would actually ask students about what they think, what kind of useful concepts or categories could be, pres could be later present in this collective survey. So uh, uh, these uh, focus groups, they would, uh, they would fulfill this explorative function. They would uh, allow us to add and modify the conceptualization and operationalization of variables in uh, the pre-existing theories or measures we are going to work with, and also the pre-existing partner university surveys, which some of the uh, uh, NLIGHT network universities are or already conducting for many years. Uh, last but not least, uh, this main instrument of this evidence-based approach to equity, inclusion, and diversity would be this collective survey. Uh, which will be conducted at these nine partner universities of the NLIGHT network. And of course, uh, uh, since I already mentioned a couple of times, since there are existing measures at some NLIGHT network universities, uh, this collective survey could be based on this. So it could actually work with something, work with the tools which have already been tested, which have already been tried on, and it could be maybe appropriated or modified in order to be a, a valid measurement tool also for other universities which have no prior experience with uh, measuring uh, uh, equity, inclusion, or diversity. Uh, also, these collective surveys could be based on validated measures uh, in psychology, sociology, or political science. So again, uh, 
on one hand, we don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel, but on the other hand, you know, in order to have a valid instrument, uh, 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 we, would, uh, <laughs> we would need to modify it or ap uh, appropriate it in a way uh, uh, that, could fulfill the, that could fulfill the desired functions. Of course, when we are talking about the survey as a tool of evidence-based approach, uh, uh, we also need to consider that there is a certain trade-off between uh, comparability, comparability and ecological validity. So on one hand, uh, this uh, survey should allow us to capture the variability of cross-cultural experiences across these nine, uh, uh, university, camp uh, uh, uni uh, nine university campuses. And at the same time, it should stay true to idiosyncrasies of each partner university and it's kind of like a, a social uh, uh, ecology. So this kind of like a social embeddedness. Um, doing this uh, uh, or conducting this uh, survey, uh, I think could help us to achieve two things. First, it would help us to create some kind of a baseline for comparison. It would allow us to see where we are standing at and, you know, like, a, 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 uh, how far did we go, for example, uh, in, uh, make, uh, in, um, uh, um, um, in making our students to experience uh, social inclusion or exclusion, or uh, how, how much our students perceive that they are being, or other, their other fellow students are being discriminated. Second function, um, which I think is equally important, is that uh, the survey could become a, a measurement tool for um, for assessing the potential impact uh, of future uh, uh, initiatives with, which deal with equity, inclusion, and diversity. Meaning that it, it could actually be used uh, uh, as something which we could ask our students' bodies you know, repeatedly after some periods of time, and by that maybe assess or evaluate whether you know, to the degree to which we have been successful or unsuccessful in fostering uh, uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity. Okay, this is uh, uh, all for me. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will be looking forward uh, to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Findel, for a also very interesting and thought-provoking uh, talk. And uh, now it is my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Duvuri. Your microphone, please. Thank you very much. I will now share my presentation. It's a great pleasure to participate in this uh, important session on global engagement and equity. We've had two very uh, passionate discussions on about both global engagement and how do we ensure that students are able to engage in global citizenship. It's equally important that universities create a climate for staff to be able to be respected and recognized, which creates the basis for any kind of global engagement. So I'm going to turn my talk into looking a bit more deeply around the approaches to equality and mainstreaming or intersectionality. Before I go into the, uh, the content of my presentation, I would like to highlight three few key messages. The first is that addressing inequalities requires long-term commitment. Low hanging fruit, which is often what we tend to look for, is insufficient and uh, not uh, effective. Second is that there needs to be continuous critical reflection on power, values, and structures that reproduce inequalities. And we need to understand the whole lived experience. And this requires nuanced, creative, and innovative thinking. And finally, and this is the bulk of this whole emphasis on global engagement and global citizenship is there needs to be an intergenerational culture change, which is essential to transform beliefs, norms, and mindsets. 
So just a brief overview of equality and mainstreaming. So the Beijing Declaration on Gender Equality uh, actually marked an important milestone in the discourse and practice on equality, particularly gender equality. The uh, Beijing Platform of Action uh, proposed mainstreaming as the strategy to advance gender equality. And mainstreaming is about bringing a focus of the contributions, perspectives, and priorities of both men and women to the center of attention in all areas of societal development. Gender mainstreaming has come to be widely imp uh, implemented to achieve gender equality, both at levels of governments, donors, businesses, and sectoral institutions, such as university. There is a, a, a kind of an acceleration of efforts, particularly in this last uh, decade. So in 2005, the call for gender mainstreaming and advancing gender equality has been taken up by universities and particularly in the UK and subsequently in Ireland with a call for the implementation of the Athena Swan Award, which was geared around bringing more women into STEM fields. And an interesting aspect of Athena Swan has been that this is one of the first mechanisms that was actually tied to funding so that there would be greater research funding for institutions that had achieved the Athena Swan Award. The mechanism has proved to be successful and now the European Commission is actually exploring schemes to institute across Europe. There have been now recent studies on the implementation of Athena Swan Charter across the various universities. And these studies do suggest that there are significant positive outcomes, but equally there are some critical challenges. The positive outcomes include increased awareness of gender equality and broader discrimination issues. So from gender equality, we are beginning to think about other forms of inequality. Improvement in, uh, in women's visibility, self-confidence and leadership. There is now across different institutions, more women in, in leadership positions. Enhancement of a supportive environment for women's careers. So there is, uh, has been a lot of thinking around the career progression and promotion. And so and revising and tweaking and refining procedures and policies to enhance women's careers. There's been increased appreciation of work-life balance and caring responsibilities. This in fact is one of the most significant outcomes because today there is a recognition of the importance of work-life balance and understanding the fundamental subordination of women for that is imposed by caring responsibilities. There have been new mentorship schemes and professional development, and there has been a more inclusive and supportive university culture for women. But there are also significant limitations and unintended consequences. First is the perception that Athena Swan is in and work on EDI implies a significant administrative overburden. Two, that overburden has become the responsibility of women. So there's an overloading of the burden of Athena Swan work on women. Three, there's been instances and a growing discourse on resentment of men, men who perceive that there is a positive discrimination and that their opportunities are being diminished. There's also the issue that the getting the award itself has become the end, rather than the award getting the award as being the beginning of a process of expanding uh, equality within institutions. 
And one of the most important problems that Tina's Ford process has, in, has highlighted is that there is this notion of competing inequalities, gender equalities dominating over other inequalities such as race, ethnicity, migrant status, or class. And finally, there has growing evidence that the process has led to uh, privileging of white women becoming the predominant beneficiaries, particularly academic women who are more privileged than other women in the hierarchy within universities. And finally, there is also an over-concentration of glass seating, focusing on senior women uh, and in senior positions, rather than looking at all of the uh, constraints and barriers for women in the lower ends of the university hierarchies. Now, it's important to remember that as gender mainstreaming gained prominence uh, across the world, there was also significant amount of discussion and gender mainstreaming was queried as to whether there was actually an equality of opportunity as well as there was querying on the homogeneity of women, the concept of women. There were contentious debates on sameness, difference, and transformation. Is equality about us being, everyone being the same? Is it acknowledging and valuing difference? Or is it about leading to transformation of the fundamental uh, power structures? So the shift to emphasis on equity as mainstreaming failed to fully deliver on equality of opportunities for all women. And equity requires that the needs of different individuals and groups are specifically met to ensure the equality of opportunities and achieve fair outcomes, as Andre said in his talk. And so for equity, you really need a intersectionality approach. Mainstreaming is insufficient. And intersectionality is the understanding that social inequalities are mutually constituting. Race, class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, nation, ability, and age to operate are not unitary, mutually exclusive entities, but rather as reciprocal constructing phenomenon, as Colin said. So we're, in other words, people's identity and social positions are shaped by multiple factors. I am a woman, I am a, a black woman, I am an immigrant. All of these have different impacts on me as an individual. Thus to understand the experiences of, for instance, Black disabled women staff members requires understanding how the combination of race or racism, disability or ableism, gender or patriarchy create specific, specific circumstances. This is very different from understanding race, disability, and gender separately, which is the hallmark of most mainstreaming approaches. But intersectional, uh, intersectionality approach actually poses some important challenges for equality and diverse work because there is a need for clear understanding of systemic and intersecting inequalities and how power and privilege are produced and reproduced. The approach can under, underscored that no inequality is more important than another and requires holistic integrated responses. Equally important is constant critical reflection with disaggregated quantitative and qualitative data to understand the lived experiences of marginalization and identify gaps in effect of policies and procedures. This reflects the points that um, Andre made. The approach also requires the querying of meritocracy, excellence, and talent 
talent becoming the buzzword of diversity work. Whose talent? What talent is being prioritized? And this is particularly important in the current context of a growing corporate managerial cultures in universities. Now, intersectionality approach has been talked about and rarely uh, adequately implemented. So there's not that much literature out there about uh, identifying best practice. There was a report by the Equality Challenge Unit, which is part of a unit within Advantage HE, which is a consultancy firm that works with UK universities that did a call for evidence of the effectiveness in, of the intersectionality approach. That report suggested that there were certain um, practices that seemed to be very effective. First was having cross-institutional collaboration between different academic and non-academic staff, as well as staff and students. Intersectionality is about understanding the whole reality for different people. So there needs to be cross sharing of knowledge and perspective. Ensuring inter intersectionality perspective is integrated into bullying and harassment policies. It's not enough to have a bullying and harassment policy, but the policy must understand who is at a greater risk of bullying and harassment. As well as uh, an interesting and innovative idea is this cross-strand approach of staff inclusivity networks. This was at the Anglia Ruskin University where the leads of the women's network, the LBGTQI network, the BME network, the disability staff network met regularly to coordinate. So the networks did not operate in isolation. And all, often the leads acted as co-leads in different networks. And staff were members of multiple networks. Again, as a, as a way to capture the whole lived experience and the different priorities individuals may have depending on which axis of inequality they are concerned about. There are also some ex uh, experience from NUI Galway that I'd like to highlight that give us some pointers. Equality, uh, diversity and inclusion work really requires a senior leadership position for EDI. NUI Galway uh, instituted the Office of Vice President of Equality and Diversity, which was extremely important in raising the profile and the commitment of the university to this, to this work. Of course, there is a danger that this then becomes the uh, responsibility of one person. For EDI work, it has to be the responsibility of all senior man managers rather than only one particular person. Another important lesson from the uh, experience at NUI Galway has been ensuring the representation of different staff networks in the EDI architecture so that all voices are represented at the decision-making table as well as introducing systematic disaggregated data collection on the basis of various grounds of discrimination across different policies and procedures rather than only in one place. So for uh, there is data now being collected on promotions as well as applicants. And these are, try we are trying to disaggregate by the different grounds of discrimination and paying particular attention to immigrant immigration status in the context of the emphasis of internationalization. Universities are no longer uh, institutions that only have staff within a local area. And the immigration status of employees does create particular barriers and constraints which actually limit their ability to travel, which can limit their ability uh, to raise their research profile, and which can ultimately limit their possibilities of promotion. 
So what are some of the ways forward? I would like to highlight two important ways forward. First, intersectionality approach requires acknowledging and valuing diverse scholarship, feminist, anti-racist, decolonial, and disability scholarship. This acknowledging and valuing of this diverse scholarship requires then diversity of staff among all grades and proportional representation of decision-making bodies, it requires actions to overcome a Eurocentric syllabi. EDI processes should ha uh, ha include feminist, anti-racist, decolonial, and disability scholarship being fed into EDI decision-making processes. There should be evidence that the precariously employed staff are involved in EDI decision-making bodies. And more importantly, there needs to be cultural awareness in assessing non-English language contributions for hiring and promotion. Equally, there need to be actions to decrease class, gender, and racial inequality within the institution. The, one of the fundamental disparities in, in institutions in academic institution is the income disparity which needs to be reduced and this disparities between the top and the bottom of the academic career as well as across the different professional grades there has to be a reduction in the number of precariously employed staff and a reduction in the number of people contracted by agencies and outsourced and most fundamentally there needs to be an end to unpaid labor by PhD candidates across different genders and racial profile. Some of the references and thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Duvuri, for also a very inspiring um, a contribution uh, to this uh, session. Um, thank you to all of you, um, to the three of you, uh, as I said, uh, for your contribution and uh, also for your time keeping. We have about 20 minutes now for uh, questions and uh, discussion. Um, there were not that really many questions in the, uh, in the chat, but I would like to give the floor to anyone in the room, um, in the virtual room, to uh, contribute uh, with a question. I propose that you just um, unmute yourself and um, ask the question or give a uh, comment. I'm sorry, Pete, uh, this is Ben, the tech host. Uh, the audience members can only write text messages uh, in the chat. Oh, okay, so okay, they sorry. Write the chat there. Okay, good. While, many, while some of you might be still considering or reflecting on um, writing a uh, question in the chat, what I would like to do, if, that's, um, if I'm allowed, um, is I would like to build on um, and, 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 and take uh, a message that has been uh, written in the chat by Patricia, who actually um, wrote, and I quote, um, we need to help our students to live in a real equity, inclusion and diversity, which I strongly support. But here I'd like to ask to the, um, the, 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 the three presenters, maybe a bit of, while well, playing the devil's advocate, maybe a bit of a critical question. I mean, what, what to do and what can the role of Enlight be to address the challenge of the fact that the access to higher education, but also the transition, the study development of certain groups within higher education. Um, what we see, for instance, in Belgium and specifically in our Flemish universities is that the, the access for students from low SES backgrounds, students from with immigrant backgrounds, um, have lesser opportunities uh, to enter into higher education and also they have lesser opportunities um, uh, to, uh, to not just to enroll, but also in uh, a, a, su a successful study development. So what we do see is to some extent a kind of selection at the gate. And then my question here, what, what is the role and the responsibility 
of each of these institutions in, in this and what can the role of Enlight uh, uh, be? Um, what I mean is, um, isn't there a danger if we do not address these issues that we might strengthen our students at our universities to become um, global citizens who are sensitive to these issues of inequity, but at the same time, by not taking into account the gating mechanisms that we might increase uh, the uh, and, and, and increase mechanisms of social inequality. This is a question for the three of you. Oh, I apologize if I may to be the first to react to what Pete has said. I think it's a it's a it's a very good remark, and I would uh, I would complicate it even further. Because uh, um, as I was listening to uh, to these presentations, uh, I realized that um, um, uh, we are actually um, uh, we are actually not taking into picture one fact is that uh, I'm I'm going to use the terminology which was uh, which was uh, which was used in the populism literature and with uh, with the Brexit, and that is that uh, that uh, there are types of uh, people who are anywheres and who are somewheres. Is anywhere they are the, basically the global citizens, but somewhere those are the people who don't have the competencies to be the global citizens, and uh, and they sometimes create this uh, populist backlash because they don't feel uh, secure, uh, they don't feel to be privileged enough uh, in their countries, and uh, uh, many of them have a feeling that they are losing out in this competition against those who are let's say more competent and who can go uh, to who can go work anywhere in the world. And uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 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 we, this is also one of the issues we should address in our universities, you know, uh, how to deal with this, how to, you know, uh, recognize this, uh, you know, uh, somewheres and anywheres kind of a, a dichotomy and, uh, and what actually can we do about it. And I apologize that I have maybe more questions than I have answers for this, but uh, I think we should not uh, close our eyes uh, uh, and not recognize this. As a, as, a, as a serious issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what, whether um, um, uh, Mrs. Fröhler and, and Dr. Duvry, whether you have specific ideas, maybe Mrs. Fröhler, uh, on the basis of um, the, the, the large and, and the, the large amount of projects you're having uh, across the globe, whether you have specific experiences where these issues are all, uh, also being addressed. Definitely. I mean, your question hits the nail on the head to the extent that indeed access is a prerogative, like it's one of the key challenges, access to tertiary education. If we look at Europe in the comparison around the globe, of course, Europe is doing enormously well. And the Enlight universities shed a light that fortunately tertiary education is available to many. But indeed, the picture looks far more bleak across the globe, particularly now with the COVID times that have unfortunately meant that many students, we're talking millions, in addition to those that were already out of school, now are out of school. And similarly for universities, those that didn't have the means to transit to the digital space also lost like hordes of students. So indeed, I think one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves in the future for more accessibility um, will be digitalization and providing digital access to those that are the furthest to be reached. And I know that it's, it's easier said than done. We, even in Europe, we are struggling with 5G, but we know 5G will come and it will soon be branching out all across the continent. But we know from our engagements with our scholars in Africa, with our scholars in, in Southeast Asia, that sometimes even witnessing a Zoom call like ours today, uses up all of their, capa their monthly capacity of bandwidth that they have uh, mm -hmm. uh, been charged for. So indeed access is crucial. How can you then make it um, more permeable? Like how can, how can in light as a system be more accessible to marginalized? Again, let me draw on mission 4.7. Mission 4.7, our endeavor to actually branch out with global citizenship education and education for sustainable development under SDG 4 target seven, which is the one on global citizenship education. 
What do we do? We don't only, and I know this is a tough call, but we don't only look at tertiary education, but it starts far earlier. We are looking at preschool education. We're looking at primary, at secondary, and also at lifelong learning. And of course, the tasks becomes, becomes even more Herculean with that. But I think in light is an important part in this overall um, kind of system. In light, having access to as many students as the universities are comprised of every year. In light now intersecting with the idea of global engagement at a time when we know this is in demand. Students want it, faculty wants it, and it is possible. In light, having funding from the EU, hopefully being able to provide scholarships to particularly marginalized, to at least already showcase a willingness to include um, people from all walks of life more equitably. It will be a drop in the ocean, surely, but it's better to start somewhere than nowhere. And again, I want to shed the light in light will be a key part, hopefully to our mission 4.7 considerations, but it will focus on tertiary education, but we have to start far earlier. And hence everyone out there who is still listening to us, who is engaged in preschool, primary, secondary, or lifelong learning, please make sure that global engagement is also part and parcel of your game-changing activities. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think this is a very important and strong message, and I, I strongly support that, because it is indeed also my personal uh, experience that uh, sometimes at the level of, of tertiary education, we, we, we sometimes take a bit of an, a too easy route, I think, by saying, yeah, we acknowledge the fact that access is an important issue, but actually the problem starts in pre-primary and in primary education, but then we, we actually leave the responsibility to solve that problem to, to, to pre-primary and primary. And I do think, I fully agree with you, that there is a kind of a shared responsibility and, then, and that we have to, and maybe in light can be uh, an opportunity to look at, at links and, and, and possibilities of cooperation between these different levels of education. Yeah, thank you very much. But maybe Dr. Duvery, you also like to add something yeah. on this. I just add a very brief comments. I think both Andre and Monica have uh, given excellent responses and highlighted the key issues. I think and light can be an opportunity then to actually systematically look, each of our universities has different policies and uh, procedures to try and uh, expand student access. One of the issues is that we have very little evaluation. How are these working? What are the significant uh, remaining challenges? So and light can be an opportunity to actually deepen our knowledge of what works. Because one of the issues is that we often go into nice rhetoric. This should be done. But we need to understand what works. And I think that is what is critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And, and again, and my apologies for the fact that I, I fall a bit out of my role as a moderator, but of course, I'm, I, I, I also do research in, in this field. But I think indeed, with, the, with the, your pointing to the, the reflecting on evaluation, um, I, I think you, you, you also address a very important fact in, in the sense that when we talk about equity and when we talk about diversity, we have to bring it from the periphery from, from the fact that it is an important topic to address into the, the, the center of what our education and teaching is about. And then we are talk about our curriculum, we talk about evaluation, we talk about uh, all, all the, the, the things that have to do with quality of, and, and the quality of our education systems and where we can find systematic hurdles that give more opportunities to some students depending on their social or whatever background and less opportunities to, to others, yeah. Thank you very much. Now, a second question I would like to ask to the three of you is, um, and I would like to build uh, on what's something that uh, Mrs. Fröhle said uh, about the importance at the end of your talk, the importance of the transformation, uh, the, the transformation which is needed um, in your educational systems, which I fully, fully support. Now, my question might be a bit of a bit a, a political question, but nevertheless, I would like to ask you to what extent and light 
needs or can play a role in this. What I do observe is that that strife, that international strife for transformation with a strong focus, especially, for instance, on the four Cs, um, is, is sometimes in attention with an increased focus at the national levels on knowledge and accountability in our educational systems. What I sometimes see in educational systems, specifically in the European context, is that there is a kind of an unintentional negative effect of PISA on um, focusing less on the four C's and focusing on that what is important, knowledge which is important for the market. I mean, I, hear, I also hear refer to the work of Marta Nussbaum with not for the profit, etc. And, and many educational systems are under pressure. And I, I do see that tension. So my question here is within that within that context of equity and, and diversity and, and, and equality, um, in relation to these two tensions, um, is there a role for Enlight here? Is there a role for the nine universities to address this issue? Is there also an advocacy role for the, in the collaboration between the Ban Ki-moon Center and the nine universities? Do we have to stand up as a university in, 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 and participate in this debate or, or not? May I start with an answer, with an attempt to answer? Thank you very much for that very key question. Indeed, the emphasis on the cognitive side of the studies is prevalent. And it's prevalent in Europe. And even when we're looking at how intelligence is measured, IQ is definitely ranking higher than EQ still. Um, and there is a great emphasis on, of course, programming and maths and the STEM subject matters, which is necessary. Why is this emphasis necessary? Because I want to use the words of Jack Ma, Jack Ma, the Chinese leader of Alibaba. Um, he says, it will, our future will be decided in the collaboration between human and machine. And the machines are obviously, when it comes to data processing, way advanced to the humans already, but we need to fuse these two. And therefore also, yes, STEM, we need to, to be able to, to utilize it to the best of our capabilities, but bring in the more human, the soft skills as well, to make in this fusion of human and machine, which will become more and more prominent, to make the best out of the potential um, potentials that are out there. UNESCO is um, clustering this idea of cognitive, also the cognitive education into global citizenship education principles. What do I mean by that? They don't only focus on the cognitive side, but say there is the socioeconomic side and the behavioral aspect to it. So I truly believe that within light and with the exchanges between the universities, with having access to the best teachers, the best courses, mobility and flexibility within the system of the nine universities, that exchange, that peer-to-peer -peer learning, that intercultural working together on real world problems, that this will pertain also to the cognitive side of things to a certain extent, but to the socioeconomic one and to the behavioral one even more so. And this is why we are fans of Inlight and believe that it needs far many more initiatives like this because it has its grounding in the actual tangible world, in the real world out there. And as much as Cheik Ma says, let's fuse human capacity and machine, I think we need to fuse the cognitive side of things with the socio-economical and with the behavioral side as UNESCO is pointing out in all the main literature that you get about it. Thank you. Um... Professor Findo or Dr. Duvuri? Do you um, have I a just, specific question? Yeah, I just want to add on to Monica's point and it took me back to my experience on women in agriculture, where agricultural productivity was the central uh, driver for many of the agricultural research institutions, but there was very little understanding that agricultural productivity and the application of technology needs a better understanding of the communities and who can and cannot implement the technology. Mm -hmm. And so it calls for collaboration. Mm -hmm. 
And the cross collaboration I also highlighted is one of the best practices for intersectionality. We need to bring different fields of knowledge to work together. And, and light might uh, be able to experiment with a open curriculum for students where we first do have some minimum requirement that all students have to take some basic philo philosophy, basic social science, and it's a requirement. Everyone has to take this. We have it in some level, but it's not well developed. Mm -hmm. So that could be an experiment that Enlight can do to bring the cognitive and the emotional intelligence together. Thank you. I don't know whether Professor Finder would like to add something on that. No, not specifically. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and unfortunately, um, um, I'm also looking in the chat. There are no, no other questions, but I think I, uh, I have to wrap up this, um, this very interesting session. And uh, personally, I would love to, to continue this uh, discussion um, because I think there are uh, still uh, a lot of interesting things we can talk about. But um, uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to thank um, uh, the three of you for uh, a wonderful presentation, really a thought-provoking pre presentation. I think this is extremely insightful and, and very important input as a kickoff for the Enlight, uh, for the Enlight uh, project. Uh, so thank you very much. And of course, I would like to thank the audience for being uh, with us and uh, for uh, sharing uh, also their uh, ideas in uh, the chat. I look forward to seeing you all in uh, to the near or not so near future. Uh, and um, I would like to, um, well, um, give you a, a successful day and um, see, you, see you later. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you very much. Bye, thank you.